And today, we take a look at one of the, well, happiest brands in audio. It's a Sony on the Vintage Vibe. By no means glamorous, purely functional. Well, aside from maybe the red velvet, <clears throat> which we'll talk about later. Designed for one purpose, Sony's TAN330ES. Sony is one of those purely likable companies with a great history, starting in 1945, creating the electric rice cooker, followed by an electric blanket, which, by the way, were complete failures. Thank God for audio fans everywhere, they created their first tape recorder, which was a tremendous success. And years later, we can't forget the Walkman. Wait, wait a second, I'm, let's do it again. The Walkman, which forever changed personal audio use. And well, with Philips, the CD. I mean, you gotta give these guys credit. They've created some great products and great audio equipment over the years. Including this, the TA-1150, one of Sony's greatest integrated amplifiers. In my Probably opinion. the only thing Sony could do better, well, <laughs> is make a good espresso. Uh, today, though, we're going to be taking a look at the TAN330ES, and that's part of the ES series or the elevated series of Sony's products. And if you're a Sony fan, you know exactly what that is. That's like comparing, well, um, accurate Honda or Lexus to Toyota. Nothing wrong with the other products, but the ES is the creme de la creme, or in this case, the crema. We're also gonna take a peek at the matching pre-amplifier that goes with these stereo power amplifiers. Stick around, and I hope you enjoy the review. One of the first things I do when I adopt an amplifier is I like to look at the power supply. And you can see the large Sony transformer here, the Gibraltar chassis underneath of it, we'll talk about that, the relays, the audio grade main filter capacitors sitting on top of the red velvet. We'll talk about that later. Some beefy heat sinks. All in all, a pretty well-built amplifier in a relatively small chassis. We'll talk a little bit about what it's capable of next. 110 watts per channel driven into 8 ohms or one single channel driven into an 8 ohm load at 300 watts when bridged into mono and really a, a low harmonic distortion of 0 0.05 and that makes for a clean yet quite punchy and powerful amplifier. So what's with the red velvet? <laughs> Actually, it was an attempt to control um, vibrations to uh, put this material, which really is red velvet, underneath the main filter capacitors. Uh, no different than the Gibraltar chassis. You can see here the honeycomb kind of on the base of the chassis. It's all about controlling vibration. Uh, and really, this is something we see in high-end audio quite a bit nowadays, with a lot of focus towards the footing on the amplifiers or audio gear. Uh, as well as um, how things are dampened. So Sony was kind of ahead of the times. So we've got on paper what looks to be a great recipe for a great amplifier. What's the catch? You know, I really didn't find one. I mean, especially considering how inexpensive these could be found on the used market, which we'll get to in a moment. In fact, this is the equivalent of the TAN55ES, which you'll probably find sells for a little bit more used. And the only difference between the two is the 330 has a switch for universal voltage. Now, the amplifier really is a well-built little amplifier. There's not a heck of a lot to go wrong inside that amp. It's easy to get at the relays to clean them if you happen to purchase one and you've got channels dropping out which I didn't seem to have a problem with it. They're, um, they use a, a well-sealed relay, so it's less prone probably to corrosion um, in comparison to some of the old receivers of the 1970s. Um, it also has a well-soldered circuit board, so I didn't see any concerns with any sort of poor solder joints. 
The only thing I had to do really on the amplifier was clean the potometers on the front for the gain control on the amp. And they aren't the greatest quality pots, but they're easy to get at and clean. And mine were oxidizing quite a bit, as well as kind of the face of the amplifier that they're mounted on. It's almost like a galvanized aluminum or a galvanized steel. So it's quite possible that maybe this particular amplifier was exposed to some um, humidity and that might have been the cause. But it's a good chance that you might run into a scratchy volume pot uh, that you may have to clean yourself on the amplifier. So other than that, I, I guess all that's left is, you know, how does it sound? I had the unique opportunity to run it in two different configurations. One stereo with uh, 110 watts per channel using one amplifier and the second configuration was using both amplifiers bridging them into that 300 watts per channel in a dual mono configuration well i actually preferred the 330 running in stereo as opposed to mono i found in stereo um, it sounded a little more rich and musical by nature i found there was um, sufficient bass, good control in the bottom end. Uh, there was a very musical mid-range. It wasn't really bright and grainy like some people might perceive Sony to be. In fact, it was a pretty refined sounding amplifier. So I thought they would sound fantastic run uh, or being run in mono, obviously, having that extra dynamic headroom, you know, of having the 300 watts now per channel because I had two of them uh, on tap for the JBLs. And you know what? The amplifier took on a harsher uh, tone or harsher characteristics. Um, they became a little more sterile sounding and I really didn't enjoy the sound of the amplifiers as much. So I think the 330s when they came out, uh, Sony was big into uh, separates for home theater because home theater was becoming kind of front and center at the time. And I know that the preamp that it was matched with, which actually was called the E2000 ESD, um, was kind of a home theater type preamp. So having the mono kind of combination would have been great probably for home theater. But when it comes to just straight two channel audio, definitely you'll benefit just by having one of these Sony's. Now, as for that um, 2000 ESD preamplifier, I absolutely hated it. Um, I found that the preamplifier wasn't very musical. In fact, I found that the power amp sounded better being driven by a mini RCA jack off the back of my um, LG cell phone. So the internal DAC on my cell phone was uh, superior, it sounded, to the 2000 ESD preamplifier. And that preamplifier, if you happen to acquire one, is riddled with a whole bunch of potential problems, which we'll talk about next. So here's a close-up of the 2000 ESD, as well as the matching tuner I was using, the 707 ES, which, by the way, is a fantastic tuner, um, in case you're wondering. You could tell, though, by even looking at the picture, there's a different quality between these two units. The top one, the preamp, even the face looks to be of a chintzier type of metal. It's it's constructed a little bit differently. And they try to jam so much into this thing. Um, it has cheap plastic knobs. Uh, however, it's got a lot of features with a drop-down kind of door at the front that's got a gazillion buttons and switches and dials. You've got uh, five different video settings. You've got CD and TV settings, two different tape settings. You've got uh, phono as well as uh, different digital inputs. Now you've got a bunch of sound field settings as well too. You know your studio, your jazz club, your hall, you name it, it's probably in there. Now when you look in there you notice there's a lot of IC chips and circuits, uh, different relays, and kind of chintzy poor connections and horrible, absolutely horrible solder connections which are a problem in this preamp. This will bring some perspective of just how many <laughs> inputs there are and again the corresponding solder points which I'm going to show you in the next video um, here.
happened to notice all of those solder points were failed. I mean, we're not talking one or two, we're talking 60 or 70. And the problem is, um, and the reason why they're prone to failure is there is no support on that board or sufficient support on the boards uh, in general inside that preamp. And when you slide the RCA um, cable in actually, it puts stress on the solder points on the board and causes them to fail. So if you have one and you've got gremlins that you're trying to figure out, there's a good chance that's the problem. And if you happen to buy one, I guarantee you, you're gonna to have to put some time in to touch up those solder points and reflow them to get it to work. And it was disappointing. I mean, after spending all this time uh, fixing these solder points, I found out that it just didn't perform very well at all. Now, what's the preamp worth in um, Canadian dollars in 2021? You'll probably pay between four to $500 for the preamp, more than the power amp, which we mentioned earlier is probably a 250 to $350 power amp. Um, so is it a yay or an A for your vintage audio collection? That's the question. Uh, the preamp, I'd pass. Unless I wanted to make a set, I'd buy it for collectability reasons only, and I probably wouldn't pay more than $200 for one um, just because it's just not worth it for me or to me. Um, the power amps, I think they're little bargains. I mean, where can you find a power amp that um, sounds really quite good for $250 to $350? I mean, unless it's an old Heffler or something like that, I mean, these are really probably one of the best um, bang for the buck out there or audio bargains at that type of price point. I mean, they look good, they sound pretty good, um, and it's one of those things that if you don't like them, you can sell them and probably get back the money for them because they're cheap. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, you join us next time as we review some other great audio pieces. Don't forget to like and subscribe.